Thanks for coming. I'm Jim Conka. I'm a, a, a planetary geologist, nuclear scientist, and uh, biochemist by training. I've been working on nuclear issues, especially nuclear waste disposal uh, and energy systems for the last 30 years. I really would like to see nuclear waste put in the ground before I die. It would be really nice. Um, <laughs> but actually, that, that that's a totally another talk. So we'll... Um, we're not going to talk about nuclear waste much today, although we know what to do with it. We know how to do it. We're just not allowed to do it. Um, today, I'm going to talk about 100% renewables. And this has come up big time recently because of uh, uh, Professor Jacobson's uh, study out of Stanford. And there's been a big huzzah about it because uh, it was a little, it was not very well critiqued or peer reviewed before it came out in Scientific American. Yet, uh, uh, state legislatures and, and some companies like Amazon are actually using it uh, for policy. So it's a little a little strange. So the big question is, can we get to be 100% renewable by 2040 or 2050? And of course we can. You just shut down everything else. I mean, you're not going to have reliable power, but you can do it if you want to. But the big question to do it correctly, how much is it going to cost? How long is it going to take? Is it even likely um, based on what's going on now and what's going on in the past? So let me just jump into it. I want to get this out of the way first. Okay, everyone wants to know what's the effect of Trump on energy, um, and actually, it won't have any effect at all. It'll have no effect on on energy. It'll have effect on regulations, unfortunately, um, because the administration in general wants to return to mid twentieth century regulatory policies, which we all know uh, weren't all that great. Um, the president supports an all-of-the-above energy strategy with a heavy tilt to fossil fuels and no regard to climate change or regulations. Uh, pipelines will get approved easily. This is a very weird subject because it turns out they're much safer than truck, trail, rail, or, or ship, depending on what you care about. Do you care about human life? Do you care about land? Do you care about water? Do you care about structures? So each of those are better than the others. So it's kind of a bizarre subject. Um, Drilling in public lands will increase, unfortunately, at great risk to these lands. They will only benefit the drilling companies. They will not benefit us, okay, because all they get is cheap, cheap land. Okay, they don't have to pay lease fees and stuff like that. Uh, it won't affect prices or supplies. We have so much fossil fuel in this country now, and uh, we, can, we can access it very well, uh, that you don't need to drill on public lands. It's just kind of a waste. Um, regulations and specific energy mixes will fall to the states. This is very critical. Because Washington State has is really nice about this. California is nice about this. Oregon. Um, some of the states like Oklahoma won't be. So, again, each state is going to come up with its own regulatory environment surrounding energy. And that's, that's a double-edged sword. Um, will not affect natural gas use. It's already cheap and plentiful. Um, this, is, this administration won't affect coal at all because natural gas is cheap and plentiful. That's the whole reason coal is, is, is uh, being displaced, it had nothing to do with regulations, nothing to do with clean power plan, nothing to do with anything except cheap natural gas. Everyone knows that. So again, you can talk about bringing coal jobs back, but it's not going to happen because it's market driven. Uh, it won't affect oil prices or production. We're already oil independent, contrary to what many people still think, and prices are decided by the world market, not by anything domestic. Now, gas prices, natural gas prices are still determined by the domestic pro uh, domestic situation because we are not linked to the world yet, but we are building uh, li liquefied natural gas facilities around the coast like crazy. And so by about 2025, we will be linked to the world market. And then natural gas prices will be determined by the world market, just like oil is. Okay, so but then gas prices will go up. And a lot of, of these assumptions you made above, of course, fall apart. Of course. <laughs> so that's, that again, it, it's, a, it's a double edged sword because then, you know, the United States has more influence in the world market, but it raises our prices. So, so it'll probably triple them. Does that bring gold back? <laughs> that's a good question. It may be, unless we change the infrastructure so much that it won't. So, again, this is, you know, if evolution always moves forward. You don't never go back. You kind of change directions sometimes, but you never go back. Uh, and so it, it's, it's going to be a very bizarre next 20 years. Um, it won't affect, uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do, Jim. Okay. Well, I guess I can't use my, uh, my laser pointer. Anyway, it will have no effect on wind or wind subsidies because red states get more renewable subsidies than blue states. Okay, so Congress is not about to change this at all. Okay. Uh, in fact, the only 
growing industry in um, Kansas is wind. Okay, kind of interesting. Nuclear power could benefit by fast-tracking licensing, but probably will have no effect either. So again, this administration will have almost no effect on our energy um, issues, but it will affect our regulatory issues. All right, so I'll get, get, get back to this. So the big question is, can we achieve this renewable, 100% renewable by 2040? And the reason, you know, why do we care about answering this question? Uh, because all, all serious studies have actually shown the only feasible low-carbon energy route uh, to, to, to satisfy the issues about, about climate change and keep us to about two and a half degrees C, uh, have to involve everything, all low carbon sources. There's no one or two sources that can do this. You need everything. And we'll talk about why that's the case. Um, so 30% uh, renewable penetration in our market is probable, uh, it's doable. 50% uh, is very difficult. 80% is theoretically possible. 100% uh, is not. In contrast, again, this, the, the, the studies out of, out of Stanford by, by Jacobson have stated, you know, we can do this all with, with wind and solar and a little bit of hydro backup, and then it's going to be low cost and reliable. And that's, that's the trick. Is it? Because one of the problems that even his colleagues at Stanford um, has pretty much said, uh, this was not peer reviewed very well, and it wasn't. Uh, and what, what um, uh, critique he got out of it, he basically ignored. So this is not particularly good to base policies because the problem is um, policies are being placed on this now, okay? States like California, of course, uh, a, a little bit of Washington State, uh, New York, uh, Amazon, Google, they're basing their future and energy policies on this study, which is, which is tricky. Um, and the problem is if you go in, in this direction, it's not going to work very well, then you will have wasted a lot of time and we do not have any time to deal with it. We have 25 years, and that's it. Um, so if you spend 20 of that going in the wrong direction, you're not going to be able to, to, to correct course uh, in time. The ethical dilemma here is that trying to be 100% renewable will prevent the eradication of global poverty. This is, uh, we'll get at the ethics of this issue. Um, as significant increases of energy are going to happen, we are going to have another 10 to 20 trillion kilowatt hours produced in the next 25 to 30 years. Right now we're 20. Um, and so, and they're going to be in countries that have no infrastructure. They have no pipelines for gas. They have no smart grid for, for, for renewables. That's why they are installing coal still, because it's the easiest thing to do if you have no infrastructure. Okay, so, um, so if you're going to base your entire energy supply on wind and solar with a little bit of, of uh, hydro backup, you have to watch out because there are uh, times when wind and sun are coincidentally not producing. And with climate change induced drought uh, coming on larger, you're gonna have a problem if that's the only three you're basing your, 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 your energy supply on. Um, okay, this is global warming for the last 500 million years, 540 million years, okay, since we've had fossils. Uh, this is very good, this is, this is not a model, this is, this is, these are measurements. So one thing, let me just see if, ah, damn, sorry. One thing you can, one thing that should jump out at you, all right? I, I apologize for the, um, uh, for the scale. Fitting 540 million years onto one graph is kind of tough. So this is thousands of years, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. So one thing that should jump out of you, at you is that we are, have, are coming out of a very cold period in Earth's history. Extremely cold, unusually cold. So much, for the last 10 million years, it's been really cold. In the last two and a half million years, we've had glaciations, which is a rare event on Earth. You hardly ever get glaciations on Earth. Uh, you know, you you need you know, the, the orbital mechanics to be correct astronomically, but you need land masses at the poles. You will not get glaciation unless you have land masses at the poles. So it's a majorly controlled by plate tectonics as well as the orbital mechanics. So we generally don't have those. So it's been really cold. Okay. Usually it's been a lot warmer and a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere, and everyone says, oh, well, who cares? That's natural, right? You got a lot of CO2, a lot of it's been warmer, so who cares? Well, actually, anything that's alive cares because change is what matters. The rate of change, not the absolute temperature, not the absolute CO2 in the atmosphere, it has nothing to do with anything. It's the rate of change. If you change too fast, things die. It's called extinction. Very natural. Not very nice if you're being extincted, but um, it's, you know, it's the rate of change only. Nothing else. So if everyone says it's been warm in the past, yeah, and things died. So 
when, when you see things changing rapidly, and right now we are coming out of this coal spell rapidly, too fast, really fast, you know, human exacerbated. So um, that's what this is all about. Nothing else. Nothing else. Just how do we deal with the fact that we're coming out of this coal spell rather fast? Um, now, if you don't believe CO2 is connected to this, who cares it is? Um, we talk about modeling. Okay, Everyone talks about modeling. And everyone poo-poo's modeling. These are very good models now. We've been doing this for 30 years. And there are two models that everyone talks about. I'm sorry to get too, too wonky on it. But B1 and A2. So B1 is we do everything we possibly can to decrease global emissions between now and 2050. I mean, everything we possibly can. Okay? We meet all of our goals you know, from COP21 and everything else. That's the best we get. It's not great. We still, we still go up three to four degrees Fahrenheit. It's not great, okay? but it's doable. Um, A2 is we do nothing. We, business as usual, two-thirds fossil fuel, one-third everything else. And that's, that's, that's not good. Okay? So now we start increasing six, seven, eight degrees to see. Um, and then it gets really hard to deal with that. Now, this is what happens in the U.S. I show this because we see Washington State out, all up at the side. So again, B1, we do everything we can. We're still going to raise three, four degrees Fahrenheit. There's no way around it. Um, and A2, we do nothing. Now we're going to be up you know, seven, eight, six, seven, eight. So that's, that's dramatic. There's a big difference here. We should actually try very hard uh, to meet B1. Now everyone, sorry, it says crop yields. Crop yields decline under higher temperature. You've, you might have heard some people say, oh, more CO2, more growth in plants. Wrong. Not correct. It's all about temperature. It's all about peak temperature, in fact. So the yields go down as the peak temperature goes up. Okay, this is a problem. Now, for Washington State, apples and cherries do very badly, which is too bad because we export more apples and cherries than everyone else in the world. Uh, but grapes and dryland wheat do really well. So wine, wine industry is fine. Don't worry. It's supposed to get a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> what about hawks? Hawks, <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's a good point. I don't know. I need to look at that. Um, so anyway, so again, you adapt. So you grow things, you grow better in that climate. We know this. We've been doing this anyway, naturally, but you, you're going to have to be more um, intentional about it. Now, this is the urgency slide. Um, everyone says, you know, what about urgency, um, tipping points and all that kind of stuff? Well, it turns out this is what they're talking about. If, if we started in 2011, decreasing global CO2, GH, you know, greenhouse gas emissions by almost 4% a year. Okay, we have to bring it down to, we can still have some significant emissions in 2050, uh, but you got to you know, dramatically lower emissions. Well, we blew that one. 2015 came around. Now you're going to have to decrease 5% a year. That's huge. Well, we blew that one. So now 2020 is coming up, and we're going to have to decrease 9% a year. What are we decreasing right now? What's our decreasing rate in? Global emissions. It's a trick question. It's right now. It's flat, but it's not going down. <laughs> it hasn't been going down. So, so we're not on track for these. And so, the whole idea of a tipping point is this gets worse and worse and worse, and then you're vertical. You can't just shut everything off overnight. So that's why you fail, and that's why everyone's saying, e, "You know, we've got urgency here. We have to have a time problem," um, and that's what the time problem is. We have to cut it really, really fast. So I love these NASA nighttime shots because you can tell right away who has energy and who doesn't. Also, when I work for NASA, um, it's kind of a spectrum. You know, it, it, you can look at this spectroscopically. So the brighter areas are essentially are, are producing more energy. Um, right now, we generate 20 trillion kilowatt hours a year. It's a good round number. Um, but we are going to 30 trillion, at least by 2040, if not earlier. And probably more than that. So this is not a static issue. It's not like, okay, we need to figure out how to replace what we have in order to decrease emissions. Um, no, we have to figure out how we're going to add energy and displace what we have. This is, this is a really tricky question. It, it's, it's stunningly difficult. Okay. Now, this is the distribution by type. Sorry. This is uh, present in energy distribution on the top for power and transportation. Power. Is two, the world is two-thirds fossil fuel. It's been that way for 40 years, going to be that way for 40 more. 
Uh, transportation is dominated by petroleum. They're not well coupled. They have to become well coupled. And that's through fully electric vehicles. If you have fully electric vehicles, now suddenly your, your, your transportation energy is being generated um, by your, your power generation. So we need to do that. It's the only way to get rid of petroleum is to, is to go to fully electric vehicles. It's going to take more energy, though, to charge those fully electric vehicles. And you want to use no, no low-carbon energy, right? You don't want to use coal to charge your fully electric vehicle because it doesn't do any good. Um, the United States, sorry, it's cut off at the top. Um, the United States is two-thirds fossil fuel, just like the rest of the world. A little bit more gas, a little bit less coal, a little bit more nuclear, a little less, less hydro. Uh, wind is coming up. But it depends on where you live. Washington State, of course, is the least carbon-intensive state in the union. It's also the least carbon-intensive society on Earth that has the quality of life that we have. Very important. We're doing really well here because of hydro and, and, and nuclear, a little bit of wind. Uh, we only have one coal fire power plant that's going away soon. Uh, it's going to be replaced by gas. Yeah, we have to. But, but again, I mean, and on, on, on uh, Washington State soil. But it's good. they're going to be replaced by gas. Not by renewables, unfortunately, but by gas. Um, so European Union is a little bit more, more nuclear because of France, of course. Korea, significant nuclear. China doesn't look like much, but they are planning 400 new nuclear power plants by 2050. 400. Okay, they're breaking ground and a new one every month. So they are determined. They've got to get rid of coal. It's really destroying uh, a lot of their society and health. And they're mainly, mainly coal. Okay, so this is the... Oh, I have, okay, my animation's coming up, sorry. Um, this is the World Power Consumption Growth Curve. It is very steep. It has nothing to do with the United States. We level at about 4 trillion. We were last century, this century is everyone else. Uh, the world, again, presently at 20 trillion. The big question, we're going to keep going up ad infinitum, or are we going to turn over some amount? I'll throw out 30, we'll talk about why. Um, right now, we're presently two-thirds fossil fuel. So if we're going to reach 30 trillion kilowatt hours in 25 or 30 years, um, and you, we're going to address any of the environmental issues we talk about, you're going to have to come up with 20 trillion kilowatt hours in non-fossil fuel just to keep fossil fuel where it is now, not to roll it back, just to keep it where it is now. You're going to have to come up with 20 trillion, which is all we produce today from everything, from non-fossil fuel. And if you want to roll back fossil fuel like you have to in order to meet, meet the B1, um, that's our B2, then, then you're going to have to come up with almost 30 trillion kilowatt hours from non-fossil fuel in 30 years. So these are big numbers, and I throw them out because they matter. The numbers matter here. And it's not the absolute numbers matter, not relative. Not like, oh, we have a 10% you know, increase. next. Who cares? I want to know how many kilowatt hours you increased. Because it's the absolute numbers that matter, not, not the relative amounts. Okay. The reason that curve is steep is because of these people that have no energy. 1.5 billion people have no access to energy whatsoever. 2.5, uh, sorry, 2.4 billion still burn wood and manure as their main source of energy, and 3 billion more people are coming on board by 2040. That's a lot of people. And you might say, well, who cares about them? We have our energy. We, we care about the planet. We don't care about them. It's kind of nasty, actually, because it turns out it takes about 3,000 kilowatt hours per person per year to have what we consider a good life, to be in the middle class. Okay? Can't do it without it. That's it. Unless you're, on a, uh, unless you're on a heavenly tropical island with all the food you need, you cannot do, you cannot have a good life without access to energy. Now, in the old days, you used to have to own people to have that much energy. A 17th century baron uh, in, in France with 10 slaves, 10 indentured servants, five ox, five uh, horses, is great calculation for students, was getting about 3,100 kilowatt hours per year out of those people. They were getting nothing, of course, uh, but he was getting about 3,100 kilowatt hours. Now, 1850 comes around, and, and the Brits uh, figure out how to use coal. They had a lot of coal, no oil, a lot of coal, and they suddenly, you know, it took about 20 years to get the infrastructure in place, but suddenly you didn't have to own anyone to get 3,000 kilowatt hours per person per year. You had to just burn coal. And besides that, you had a lot, not just a lot of energy, but you could coke steel. And so suddenly, 1870 comes around, and the Brits are producing steel battleships. What do you think steel battleships would do against the rest of the world's wooden battleships? Yeah, they dominated the seas in the second half of the 19th century. That was the British Empire, because they had coal. Only because they had coal, and therefore they had steel. Now, it took everyone else a little while to come on board. The United States came up about... Um, 
the turn of the 19th century, turn of the 20th century, we had oil. They didn't have oil, but we had a lot of oil. And we discovered it. We found out it's much better than coal. So we were running oil fired battleships in World War One, and they ran, ran rings around Brit, Brit's still coal fired battleships. So again, this is all about energy. This this stuff, energy underlies everything in, in humanity. Um, then then we came on. Uh, excuse me. Uh, then we started bringing up hydro in the 30s, uh, natural gas, nuclear in the 50s and 60s. So by 1970, the United States had 200 million middle class. It dwarfed the rest of the world. We were absolutely the powerhouse, economically, militarily, because we had so many middle class. Oh, I didn't put the other slide in. I'm sorry. Um, so, so 1992 comes around. The, the Chinese government has pretty much sloughed off most of the effects of the Cultural Re Revolution, and the Chinese public power is now 80% scientists and engineers, 1992. 80% scientists and engineers. Think of what Congress would be here, 80%. percent would have different outcomes, definitely different outcomes. And this is no secret or anything. So they said, okay, we need to build 600 coal-fired power plants beginning in 1992 and ending in 2010. 600 coal-fired power plants. And suddenly, in 2010, there was 500 million middle-class Chinese. All right? Since your economic military power derived directly from the absolute number of middle-class in your society, who do you think is going to dominate the second half? of the 21st century because all of their policies now are getting the remaining 800 billion into the middle class. So by mid-century, China will have a billion middle class or more. Okay, Very important. It's all because of energy. Okay, so this is what Judith and I came up with. Judith Wright, my spouse and colleague, um, came up with it some years ago and they did change it because there's too much fossil fuel left in it. But how do you cut fossil fuel back and still grow, okay? And the way to do that is to cut fossil fuel to a third. So a third, a third, a third. A third fossil fuel, a third renewable, and a third nuclear by 2040 and 2050 is a way to address this issue. Um, now, the way to, and, and it's, it's, it's not easy, okay? Uh, a third fossil fuel would require 4 million big wind turbines, so 4 million megawatt-sized wind turbines. That, that's a lot. Um, 1,700 new nuclear reactors. That's a lot. It's the easiest one technically, but it's the most difficult one politically. Four, uh, sorry, 100 billion barrels of biofuels a year. Four trillion from solar and three trillion from hydro. These are big numbers, big numbers. And they have to be big because if you're going to attack 30 trillion kilowatt hours and get rid of fossil fuel, you, your power source better be in the trillion kilowatt hour range or it won't do anything at all. Now, why is nuclear down here? Are we going to have nuclear-powered cars? God, I hope not. It'd be a bad idea. Um, but you're going to have to be charging over a billion fully electric vehicles, and that's going to take a lot of energy. Um, so you're going to have a lot, and you're going to need a lot of base load energy, and you don't want it to be coal. Um, and your wind and your solar are actually trying to displace fossil fuel. So what are you going to do? You need all the non-fossil fuel sources, and that's what this this. Uh, talks about. And I still have coal and gas up there. That's that's a real we're not going to get rid of coal and gas. I'd like to, but we're not going to because we have too much of it. Um, in the world as well as in the United States. By the way, the United States now produces more gas, natural gas than anyone in the world. We have the biggest reserves relative to anyone in the world. We have more coal than anyone in the world and now we have just about as much oil as anyone in the world. Is, is that 11% dark blue wind? I can't? Yes, I can't. That's a right. um, really small contribution from wind. Why so small? Because it's difficult to build them. That's well, right. Right now, what are we at right now? World, I'm sorry, this is, That's for the world. this is for the world. Oh, for the world. For the world, we're at less than 1%. In the United States, we're at about 6%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Sorry. I mean, I'm trying to give the global thing first, because that's why we're doing this. I mean, it's, it's not we're doing this for a lark. This, we're doing this to try to to deal with the global issues like climate change. Okay. Um, oh dear. Sorry. Uh, I just want to di digress a little bit to Washington State. How do we achieve a low carbon future for Washington State? Well, we already are. Okay. We're, we're already the lowest uh, emission state in, in the Union and well, almost in the world. We're 78% hydro, 9% nuclear, 6% wind, 4% coal, 3% natural gas. Um, We've decreased our emissions since 1990, mainly because we got very good in the agricultural and industrial sectors in decreasing. Our main source now 
is gasoline. That's the biggest source of CO2 emissions, uh, GHG emissions in the state, is from gasoline. And the only way to get rid of gasoline is to go to fully electric vehicles. Not hydrogen, fully electric vehicles. We can do that. And they're, they're very effective. Okay? Because we have so much non-fossil fuel general electricity that when you gen when you charge your fully electric vehicle in the wa in Washington state you're getting the equivalent of over 100 miles a gallon from an internal combustion engine um, if you're in Oklahoma it doesn't matter you can have a fully electric vehicle but there's so much coal and gas that that your emissions don't change at all uh, having a fully electric vehicle so it really depends on how you charge your car really really important I'm going really fast, sorry. I just want to get through this. Um, oh, I, again, yeah. So, so again, because most of our energy is, is our, our electricity generation is non-fossil fuel. Um, and again, if you're in Indiana, Oklahoma, Kansas, all of those states, um, it doesn't really matter. Now, if we replace 80% of our cars with electric vehicles by 2040, we could cut our emissions by 60%. It's the fastest, easiest way to do it. And that's it. I mean, you're just going to do this. Um, and you have to say, well, what policies are going to do that? What are policies are going to get people to buy fully electric vehicles? First, we have to produce them in the, that number, which we are uh, beginning to, and then you have to push it. And that's where policy comes in. Now, the reason the United States is so good, we actually met more than our climate goals. From some, you know, Trump wants to pull us out, but it doesn't matter. We've already met our goals better than anyone else because we've been replacing coal with gas. That's it. That's why we are at a 25-year low in United States emissions is because coal is going away and gas is replacing it because it's cheap and plentiful. Here's what happened after we got fracking down. And fracking is continuing. It's not, you know, the last two years, you can't believe how more efficient fracking has become. It's just rather incredible. Um, and as a geologist, we're going to why that is the case. But yeah, so about 2006, we really started big, and we have just gone like crazy. This is why, this is why gas is so cheap, and so plentiful, and why coal is going away. Here's the gas plays in America that are frackable. See, or or, or drilling with ordinary drill, drilling as well. Um, this there's actually more gas than this, but it's not right now economically recoverable. Whenever anyone talks about reserves or what we have, it's always about what's economically recoverable. And that changes with technology. So 20 years ago, none of this was accessible. Well, some of the Wollaston Basin and things, Permian Basin and things, but most of this was not accessible 20 years ago. Now it is. It changes the whole picture. And this is why things are changing so fast. Okay, so I was going to ask, what's the fastest growing energy source in the world? I had a little animation in there, but uh, it's coal. The fastest growing energy source in the world is coal. Why? Yeah. India. Not necessarily. You don't it's, need a lot of infrastructure. Yes, you perfect. You're selling a lot of its coal to other countries. No, no, it's just, no, no. We, we aren't selling much of our coal to other countries. Um, it's easy to do. If you are a poor country with no infrastructure, it's simply easier to put in coal than anything else. There's no question, there's no, the distant second. You don't have pipelines for gas, you don't have, have, have... I'll challenge that. If I'm Malawi in Africa or someplace with no infrastructure, no ports, bad roads and no distribution thing, distributed solar going out to the towns is much easier to deploy than coal. Yes, for for if we're talking at zero infrastructure price, if, yeah, and if you're st stuck with zero infrastructure, you're right. That that's it. But no one is doing that. So, you know, but but, but if you just coal is coal is easiest. Yes, coal is, is the easiest. No solar. If you're zero infrastructure, which is you said for zero infrastructure places, okay. starting from ground up, distributed generation solar is much. You're right. You're going to have to put in a rail line. You're going to have port. to have a port. But most poor countries have those. Okay. I gave an example of one that doesn't. So it's cheating. Malawi has no ports and no <laughs> Okay, Malawi. Okay. Uh, Malawi is stuck. I'm yeah, really it sorry. is. I'm really sorry for that. But this is why coal is still growing. Because all the other countries that are poor are installing coal because it's easy, they can get it, um, and they can't do the other things. Um, so, so if we 
But, and again, if, if we're talking about displacing coal and gas, and petroleum's not on this because petroleum isn't used very much anymore except in the Middle East to, to produce electricity. But if you were to put that in, 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 in terawatt equivalents, it would be between coal and gas. So here the top three growing energy sources in the world are fossil fuel. And we're talking about eliminating them. And they're still growing dramatically. This is, you know, I mean, this is reality. So we've got to deal with that. So if we're going to displace those with these, you're going to need them all. You're going to need all low carbon sources. You can't get rid of hydro and nuclear and say, okay, we're going to use those to displace all of those and to displace hydro and nuclear. That, that's insane. I mean, you're just not going to do it. We only have 25, 30 years. That's it. We're, you know, you can't do that in 25 or 30 years. We might be able to do it by 2200. Sure. But not quick enough. Okay, if we blow up the non-fossil fuel, this is what it, what it looks like. Um, so for wind energy alone to replace coal and oil, just say coal and oil, not gas, um, will require about 8 million megawatt turbines, uh, 4 billion tons of steel, and 8 billion tons of cement. What's the global output of steel? 1.5 billion tons a year. We're going to need 8, and we're going to need 4 billion tons just for wind turbines. So we're going to have to make these global trade agreements with China. You're not going to build any, any more buildings. You're not going to build any more cars. We're not going to build golf clubs, nothing. We're going to need this steel for wind. Draw the line, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, you start taking it. You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> okay, that's because, again, wind is, is material intensive. It's 10 times more material intensive than almost anything else. Um, and gas is the least. Why do you think we're building gas plants all the time? It doesn't need hardly any steel or, or concrete. You can throw them up really quick. Gas is cheap. We've got pipelines like crazy now. So that's why gas is the major build in the United States. So, but hey, so let's back off a little bit. We do wind, hydro, nuclear, and, and solar also. But we, this is just to replace coal and oil, not, not gas. We could get away with maybe 4 million megawatt wind turbines and a doubling of hydro and nuclear. Still, it's going to take huge global trade agreements to corral the amount of steel we need over the next 20 years. That's, that's, that's a big deal. No one ever talks about materials. It's boring. Who cares about steel supply in the world? But it's the limiting factor for wind. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, so if you're going to talk about 100% renewable, you have to talk about Jacobson. Um, and there's a big war going on between between Jacobson and the rest of the scientific community. Um, pretty much he had he had some pretty ridiculous assumptions uh, and requirements that he kind of poo-pooed. Um, and I just want to go over those. His model assumes a nuclear war every third 30 years or so. Did I miss one? I don't I don't remember one. Um, yes, yeah, so which was weird because again, nuclear energy and nuclear weapons have nothing to do with each other. You can't make a weapon from a, from spent nuclear fuel from a power plant. We tried. We tried a lot. Uh, in the 60s, we made a little crappy device, but no one in the world has made weapons has ma has involved nuclear energy at all. Okay, N North Korea, they're, they're weapons reactors. The ones out at Hanford were weapons reactors. You can't build a bomb with a normal power reactor. Okay. Um, Assumes the rate that we can build renewable energy is 10 times greater than, than we've ever done at any point uh, with no regulatory issues, like no one's going to worry about this, uh, and no other concerns that would slow the project. So we're going to start now. We're going to build out 10 times the rate that Germany's been building, 10 times the rate anyone's been building um, right now, and there's going to be no problem. No one's going to care, right? Assumes that 50 million acres, uh, 15 million is covered by wind and solar, would have no environmental impacts or public concerns, even though that much area would exceed all of the human-covered structures today. Okay, so all the roads, all the buildings, all the cement, all the concrete, everything, it's going to exceed that. Um, but there would be no problem. Um, sorry. Assumes intermittency, you know, things don't work 24-7, uh, is not an important issue and can be dealt with easily with no baseload power. It hasn't happened yet. Uh, and it's why we install so much natural gas alongside wind, or in, in, in the Pacific Northwest, we use hydro. Um, assumes energy storage with hydrogen and heat stored in rocks buried underground. We don't do that. We've never done that. It's not practical. Um, it's never been put in place at all, 
and our large storage is moving in other directions like like you know, vanadium flow batteries. Really brilliant. In fact, Washington State is leading that uh, in pumped hydro storage, which is pretty good too, except you need to be in the right ge uh, geographic location. Assumes demand can be easily adjusted and quickly uh, at no cost. It's called demand response. We've actually been doing that in the state. It's not cheap. <laughs> okay, it's not easy. So, okay. Um, that uh, demand response is you you call Amazon and you say shut down for a couple of hours because we can't produce enough power and they they just, just shut down. Oh, that's a bad example of demand response. <laughs> Why don't you talk about charging Manuf electric cars? Manufacturing. So, so manufacturing so is also a bad example. No, that, that, that's that's the problem. You don't want to to use a manufacturing demand response. Right. right. No, yeah. Yeah. You don't want to use most things for, for demand response. Right. But things like heating hot water and charging EVs. Are good examples for uh, yes, demand yes, response. And we are doing that. Right. So it's not enough. If you're going to talk about demand response. Right, right, don't right, think right. of the worst example. Think of the <laughs> best one. Okay. Well, there's, there's no great example except well, your hot water heater at home. Yeah. No, electric car charging Absolutely. is a and great. Electric car charging too okay. is a great if, one too. But if we have a yeah, if we have enough. If we're going to, you great. already talked about we need to go to electric cars. Right. And if we charge them with demand response. Then they help make the grid more stable with renewables instead of less stable. Excellent. Wonderful. Good. Okay. Um, world scale. <laughs> I don't expect the world to go electric cars. Well, the world has world. to. No, I think uh, EVs. The world's ahead of us. True. China, yeah, China, China is definitely going to get rid of it. Buying electric cars is unlikely because they can't afford them. No, they have no. a lower cost of ownership probably in five years. Okay, yeah. Shanghai is a perfect example. It's really great. It's wonderful. If the world can go like Shanghai, that's great. It's not going to, but if it could, it would be wonderful. Um, so anyway, so assumes the cost is no problem at all, and cost will continue to go down for the next 50 years. That's, that's unlikely, especially for steel and rare earth elements and other rare elements that we use and need for these. China controls the rare element market, not just the rare earth element, but the rare element market. Um, and I Price is not going to continue to go down um, for those materials. Assuming scaling up from the lab to the field is trivial, has anyone ever scaled the technology from the lab to the field? Yeah, I have several times. Okay, When it works, it's great. It doesn't always work. Not at all. Because um, reality kind of has a way of stepping in. Um, but that applies to the nuclear as well. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but we've done a lot of that. So. New scale is wonderful. So we'll, we'll get to new scale. Yeah. Assumes transmission increases are no big deal. Is that, a, is that a good assumption? Because the smart grid is very expensive. It costs about a trillion dollars for the United States. We need to do that. If we're going to do any of this, uh, we need to do that. And it is, this is the worst one. It, it assumes unlimited hydroelectric power as backup, with new installations equal to 600 Hoover dams. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, yeah. Yeah, this is Hoover Dam, so we need 600 of these more. Um, that's unlikely. In fact, we're trying to take them down. No one will will fund uh, a new large hydro. Um, now, you could upgrade. So here's our existing hydro fleet uh, in, in, in the country. Um, here's hydro... Whoops. Oh, there's a one missing. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. To it. There's another map like this with a similar amount of dots in it. Unpowered hydro dams. We have a lot of hydro dams that are not electrified. Right? They're just dams okay, for water. We could electrify those, and we could double the amount of hydro in this country if we do that. There's a plan um, from in, in, at DOE and, and the, um, the, the National Hydro Power Association to do that. Okay? They have so far run into huge regulatory and public outcry. So, okay, but we're not going to do that either. Um, but we need to. And, again, this is hydro. Um, in, in terms of what we need to do in, in order to, to build that much hydro backup. Um, unfortunately, it's, there's some inconsistencies in this plan because he says we only need about you know 400 terawatt hours, but then he says we need 1,300 backup as backup. Well, okay, if you have stuff as backup, you can't just sit at idle. You still have to pay for it, right? So when you have idling hydroelectric dams and idling uh, coal plants and gas plants, you still have to pay. Right? It's not free. Um, so one of the problems is if you, the, the, the bottom line there, okay, this is the max, I don't have my pointer. The top dotted line is the maximum build rate we've ever made for anything that generates power. Okay. The average one is, is, is the lower dotted line. So 
again, this is what we've done. Even when we have tried really hard and spent a lot of money doing it, that's all we ever build out. According to get to 100% renewable, you're going to have to raise that 14 times over the average. You're going to have to build, be building more than you can possibly imagine. And we just don't do that. Okay. I mean, the country is going to, you know, Trump's going to have to say we're going to build wind 10 times faster than we've ever built wind before and, and solar and, and hydro. So how likely is that? I mean, again, it's, it's not that you can't theoretically do anything. It's just that how likely is it to be done uh, given history and given the amount of materials and money that we have. So this is the total uh, renewable Increase that we have to do. We have hydroelectric again has to increase 13 times, wind 33 times, solar 200 times. Uh, we have to decrease everything else. We hydrogen production. I don't know why, including hydrogen production, because we don't produce hydrogen very much, significantly at all, and we we make it from from methane. That's the only way we make hydrogen. We don't make it from water. We make it from methane. Um, so that's unlikely. Um, storage. Yeah, I, I actually think we'll get storage. You know, battery technology, pumped hydro. It's great. We'll get that, but I'm not sure we'll get that much by that time period. So again, the total capacity in the United States has to increase 10 times in the next 30 years. So back to this. So coal, again, is growing. Gas is growing. You want to replace hydro and nuclear with, with, with renewables? Okay. Um, it's kind of tough. They, they're just not producing much, and the rate of growth even in Germany, is not enough to do this. It's all about rates. I mean, you are not going to suddenly overnight get to this point when you've done almost nothing to get there. Now, there are places to put things that are good, okay? Now, I have a solar array on my roof. I'm not sure if I, I, I kept those slides in. Um, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, thank you very much for paying for it. I really appreciate it. This is no. This is taxpayers' dollars. I I have no utility bill. I get thirteen hundred dollars a month uh, from the state of Washington. So, you know, fifty four cents a kilowatt hour. I get paid whether I use it or not. And you all pay for it. So thank you. Um, I just needed some street cred out of solar. Um, but that's not that's not a good play. So you're going to put solar. You absolute distribute it over every existing surface in the red area. Then then you get significant solar. Same thing with wind. Wind is only good in Tornado Alley. It's not very good in, in, in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, all wind does here is displace hydro anyway, so it doesn't do anything. But the capacity factors for wind, how often they're producing energy, and the amount of energy they produce is exquisite in Tornado Alley. Also, the birds learned over thousands of years not to migrate through Tornado Alley. So there's no bird deaths there and wind. It's, it, that's the place you want to put wind. Okay, You don't want to put it over here. Now this is the this is BPA. This is our our generation here, um, Seattle and, and all of Washington State. Um, in fact, this is the whole BPA system. So, sorry, the, the legends up there. Uh, red is the load. So red is the demand. So that's the amount of, of electricity that we needed um, reliably. Uh, blue is hydroelectric. So again, it just tracks it perfectly. Um, wind is green. It, it comes and goes. And then the brown is everything else. Um, all Whenever wind comes up, what happens? You just shut down hydro. It doesn't displace coal. The one coal plant we have, they don't do anything. It doesn't displace gas or anything else. It displaces hydroelectric. And our hydro dams are one of the river dams. They're not storage dams. So you displace hydro, you have to, you have to spill the water. There's nothing. You, you, don't, you don't build up the water in hydro dams. Okay? Not in these. Um, so, again, all you're doing is displacing hydro. All you're doing is displacing hydro. You sit in the water and you use it some other time. Well, I, I, I take it up to you. You can't do that. Anyway, so how much is it going to cost? And does it matter? Does cost matter? Okay? And, and I actually say it really doesn't. Okay? Um, it turns out, this is the history back to the 1300s in England. This is the, the cost of energy. Okay, now mostly it was you know, muscular and chemical before that. And then 1850 comes around and coal comes on board and everything else, and it drops precipitously. Right now, energy is the cheapest it has ever been in the history of humanity. It's cheapest right now than any other time in history. Now, you can see the, the oil embargo little peak there in 1973. Um, so it's cheapest now. So if you're going to make radical changes, 
Now's the time to do it, actually, because energy is so cheap. And because energy is so cheap, food is so cheap. Food has never been cheaper in the history of humanity than it is now because of energy. Sorry. So if we look at levelized costs. So what does it cost? I hate levelized costs because it has too much junk in it that has nothing to do with production costs, but that's okay. This is what the state legislatures use to make decisions. Okay. So um, so this is the, the, the levelized cost. It's kind of a lifetime cost for new plants. And you can see gas is cheapest, so that's why we're building gas. Uh, you can see uh, wind and solar is expensive, but not that much. Um, in fact, except for gas, there's really not a lot of difference here, right? If you're going to make decisions about saving the planet, are you going to care about a couple of cents per, per kilowatt hour? Should you care about a couple of cents? If all you care about is short-term profit, nothing's going to happen. And of course, America cares about short-term profit more than anything else. So, the, you know, you need to actually make long-term goals, stick to them, and then decide how to finance them. Don't finance them first. We don't do financing very well in this country because it's too short-term. Okay, so this is the overall cost. So, so does the nuclear cost figure in the dealing with the waste? And yes, the yes. In, in fact, nuclear is the only one that pays for its waste disposal. And, and we can get back to talk about wasting it. If we have plenty of money to take care of waste. It's not Yucca Mountain, unfortunately, because it costs too much. You need to do the right, you need to follow the science. Right now it's all political, so we can't do anything. The gas has the volatility built into it? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, that's a good point. They don't know about that. Okay, so it would be a lot higher. Yeah, it would be a lot higher. But it's been low for quite a few years. Well, it'll be it's low nice. for at least 10 more years. I mean, there's no, yeah. you know, enough, to get it, the, enough to get it so into the infrastructure that it would be hard to get it out. Okay, now where, where am I here? I, something's, I can't see my thing here. Okay. All right. In the United States... By about 2040, we'll be at about 5 trillion kilowatt hours. Um, and if we continue with the present mix we're on, so two-thirds fossil fuel, one-third everything else, uh, it will cost about $12.5 trillion from now to then, and $1.7 trillion will be capital. So, And the reason we pick you know, mid-century is by, by that time, almost everything that's existing now will be dead and it will have to be replaced. So you can just wipe it clean. What is it going to take to produce... To, to build systems that will produce 5 trillion kilowatt hours a year by 20, 2040 or 2050. So using these numbers, oh boy, sorry. So again, it'll business as usual, two-thirds fossil fuel, one-third everything else, it's going to cost $12.5 trillion, and $1.7 trillion of that will be capital. If we go to a mix of a third, a third, a third, so a third fossil fuel, a third renewable, a third nuclear, it's going to cost about the same, but a larger percentage of that will be capital because now you're building more renewables, you more steel and concrete, less fuel up, up the stacks, right? So you actually are paying for things, which I like. Infrastructure is good. It's a good thing to pay for. I don't want to pay for greenhouse gases to go up the, up the stack. Um, now, funny is that this mix uses half the fossil fuel, so it saves 2 billion tons of CO2 a year from the United States, but the healthcare savings alone more than cover the increased capital because – if you're a country and you have significant coal in your generation mix, your health care costs are increased about 10%, about 10%. So for us, that's about $400 billion a year because we burn coal. China's a little bit more, quite a bit more, actually. Um, so again, there's an, there's an issue here that's not usually captured in most cost analysis is, is health care. And fossil fuels, you get rid of fossil fuels, you, you have a lot less upper respiratory deaths and things like that. Um, now... I had another one on here, sorry. So for, for 100% renewable, it's going to cost you $25 trillion, and $20 trillion of that will be capital because it's all capital. Okay, Renewables are all about capital. Okay, There's no fuel cost, so that's great. Uh, O&M is, is not so bad. Um, so you have, you have no fuel cost, but you have a lot of capital costs. So that's, that's the difference there. Okay, how is it going to cost? Uh, that's what I was at, Jim. Um, let me see. I'm doing this twice here. Okay, there it is. If we go to 100% renewable mix, it costs about 25 trillion, so about twice as as, as the other mixes. Um, 20 trillion of that is capital. It doesn't use any fossil fuel, so it saves four billion tons of CO2 a year. And in the healthcare savings are about four trillion, which is not trivial, um, but it's not enough to cover the 20 trillion increase in capital. So so you're gonna have to pay for it. There's no way around it. Um, 
Now, so what happens with, with, with the tax credits? Okay, everyone talks about tax credits. Um, this is the operating cost. This is O&M cost. So it's, it's paying people, uh, it's maintenance, it's refueling, things like that. Uh, it's not fuel and it's not construction. So once they're constructed, um, what happens when you give them um, a tax credit, a production tax credit? Well, what happens is the wind goes negative, of course. So we talk about negative pricing. You've heard negative pricing, right? That's why it is. So solar even more so. So now you can act if, if during the afternoon in California you have so much solar uh, that they can pretty much give it away and still make a lot of money. And that's and you can't compete with that. I mean, there's no way to compete with that. Um, so that's what we talk about negative pricing. So negative pricing is an interesting thing. Um, the costs don't go down. They're just shifted from the rate pay to the taxpayer. And you might think that's fine because taxpayers have no idea what they're paying for. And so, but the ratepayers do. So, so if your if your bill at the end of the month gets lower, that looks really good. It feels really good, but you're still paying for it. Now, whenever the tax credits expire, construction goes to almost zero, and then we wait until Congress reauthorizes it. Fortunately, Congress has reauthorized it to 2020, I think, or 2021. Um, but again, it's all about the tax tax credits. You cannot make money unless you have these tax credits during operation, once it's constructed. Um, so low carbon electricity markets are fundamentally different than the traditional electricity market because of this. So during the daytime, this is in California, during the daytime, you have so much uh, solar now in 2017 that it, the prices go negative. You might say, that's great, right? That's great. But you kind of forget that we're a capitalistic society. So it has to make a buck. So it has to make a lot of money, in fact, to do things. So right there, when the prices are negative, you're not making any money in general. And when it goes negative like that, the price the, the price doesn't go down. Okay, It's just that the, the cost the cost uh, of the electricity goes down. Back up a little bit, sorry. Um, when you approach about 30% uh, penetration in, in the market, um, what happens is that you have you have to have backup, right? You have to have backup when the, when the sun isn't shining, um, and so those plants now are, are are not very happy because they're they're just waiting to produce electricity to buffer the, the intermittency of solar, and they can't charge anymore. So they have to be idle. Coal plants, gas plants have to be idle during this time. Oops, during this time they have to be idle, and then they have to fire back up. So they actually want to charge more. Because they're not making any money, because they're just sitting idle for, for most of the afternoon. And that changes the plant. So, as more uh, solar plants are built, the prices um, at times of high solar input collapses, and that changes the market. And that's we haven't dealt with that yet. There's a new industry called energy imbalance market. It's really interesting. An entire industry around this issue. And they're making a lot of money. Um, Um, at the same time, again, there's only small changes in the price. The other power plants are required to provide electricity at the, all their other times, um, and they only produce electricity for a few hours per year relative to solar and wind. So the investors are not going to build those new plants. This is the pro this is going on in Germany right now. The, the, the electricity generation industry is, is um, sorry, the profits are going down dramatically. The transmission industry is going up. So now the electric generation is selling off their assets and they're going to transmission. So someone has to want to produce electricity. And if you make it difficult and they can't make money on it, they're not going to do it. So Germany is facing a crisis here. Um, in Who is going to make the backup electricity to buffer the renewables? I mean, Germany is easy because you can just buy it from other, other countries. Okay, so this is what happens. High price when electricity uh, is low wind and high demand. Negative pricing when you have excess wind. So, so the price is all over the place. And so it's, it's not a stable market. And that's unfortunately markets like stability, right? No one invests in things unless there's a stable market there. Um, and so this is, you know, this is a crisis. We'll get to it. We'll deal with it. Um, so right now in Europe, um, those countries that have the highest uh, renewable penetration also have the highest price. And, and you might say, that's okay. It's okay. Again, electricity is relatively cheap, so doubling your costs is no big deal. We can deal with it. We're rich. Um, but that's the issue.
Do you care about cost? I don't really, because it's so it's cheap here. It's so cheap. Um, oh, my solar panels. Okay. Um, so, was I unethical in installing this rooftop solar system? Um, here's my generation throughout the year. Um, right now, I say, I hate to say, it, say I paid eighteen thousand for this four kilowatt hour array. Um, I immediately got six thousand dollars back, um, and then the state pays me fifty four cents a kilowatt hour, so it'll be paid off in five years, and then I'll have free electricity for another twenty. Uh, the house used my house used twenty thousand kilowatt hours last year. Um, I bought 16,000 of that at $0.07 cents a kilowatt hour at that time. Uh, my PV system pr produced 4,500, of which I avoided paying another 2,000, but then I got paid $0.54 cents a kilowatt hour, so the, the state sent me a check um, for 2,400 bucks. And I, again, I thank you very, very much. Um, let's see. So, so back to the cost. So these are the overall costs. Now, there's other costs involved, right? We talk about externalities. It's the whole reason we care about climate change. It's an externality. Um, it doesn't come at the end of the month in your bill. You're not paying for it. No one's actually paying for it, except the future, our kids, our grandchildren, polar bears. I mean, someone's paying for this, okay? And it's not us. So right now, we have two ways of, of kind of corralling externality costs. We talk about a physical footprint. We talk about a carbon footprint. A carbon footprint is not just about carbon. It's about everything. So when you have a high carbon footprint, you usually have a high other footprint. Whether it's, it's coal, you have a high mercury footprint, you have a high sulfur footprint. If you're drilling, if you have you know impoundment dam failures for, for coal, um, coal uh, yeah, filings. So there's other environmental issues involved in the carbon footprint. All right. So just don't think of it just carbon. Um, and then there's the physical footprint. And we don't know how to deal with that. I mean, what, what's an acre worth? Um, an acre of pristine land. Well, the, the, the European Union assigned it 100 bucks an acre. They really simply pulled it out of the air. But okay, they assigned it 100 bucks an acre. So if you look at the different energy sources, again, carbon footprint, it's all about fossil fuel because it's all about carbon. Physical footprint is all about renewables because it takes a lot of area. But low carbon footprints, there's no zero carbon footprint. We're talking about life cycle carbon footprints. You have to mine steel, you have to smelt it, you have to mine uranium, you have to smelt that. Uh, you have to pour concrete. Concrete is the most uh, carbon-intensive activity you can do. So that's why hydro is so large. Uh, solar takes a lot of solvents to, to make solar cells. Wind and nuclear have the least. And then there's another, another issue, um, the death print. Okay. The death print. So... Not sure if I have this on here. Okay, good. So coal kills so many people, you have to push that off to the side because it just kills so many people. So this is the 40 deaths per trillion kilowatt hours produced by these energy sources. And again, coal is it. I mean, if you, if you need an evil, coal's an evil. Um, it kills a lot of people. Uh, it's upper respiratory effects. The lungs don't like breathing burnt carbon. We know that, right? Smoking isn't good for you. We don't like burnt carbon. Uh, gas is not nothing. Hydro... These are all accidents, by the way. Um, so hydro dams don't fail often, but when they do, it's dramatic. Um, so the 1976 Bonkyo dam failure in China killed 173,000 people. Puerto Rico just kind of and, and yep, Puerto Rico. So it doesn't happen often, but when it does, it's it's not nice. Um, these are all simply accidents, mainly falling off of structures. So I mean, come on, we can rope up. Uh, the guys that put on my, my solar cells, I can't believe it. I have a scary part of my roof. I would never go up there. I would never let anyone go up there. They were just walking around like it was nothing. They weren't roped up or anything. I, I couldn't believe it. I'm looking at it. It's a 40-foot drop. So, But, you know, they fall off occasionally, kill themselves, and that's what that number is. Uh, same thing here. This, this is one person that fell off a scaffolding about four years ago. So, uh, again, you know, these are, these are kind of real. These are accidents. We can be better at accidents, right? We're, we're pretty good at that. Um, come on, stop it. These are the actual numbers. Uh, I'm sorry, up there, coal is global average up there. 100,000 per trillion kilowatt hours um, produced die every year globally. Now, in the United States, we only kill 10,000 people a year. I'm supposed to get a laugh. Uh, hey, it's better than 170,000, but it's still 10,000. Um, the World Health Organization just just declared biomass burning as a major epidemic in the third world and in, in the developing world. 
Um, again, we don't, our lungs do not like to breathe in this stuff. And again, these are just accidents. Now, here's coal global average, here's coal US average, hydro global average, hydro US, nuclear global, nuclear US. Why is US so lower, so much lower in their death rate? Regulations, regulation, regulation. So this is because of the, of the Clean Air Act. 1976, the Clean Air Act is the single piece of legislation that saved the most lives of any piece of legislation in history. Well, I've gotten pushback on the labor laws in the 1930s, but okay, I'll give it that. But still, the Clean Air Act has saved more people. It's what cleaned up the air in the L.A. I remember going to L.A. before the Clean Air Act. God, it was horrible. Um, why is this better? Why are we better at that? FERC, yes, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. They actually inspect dams. <laughs> and like Priest Rapids out here a couple of years ago, they find a crack, you are shut down. And, and that's it. You fix that or you're never going to sh- start up again. Same thing with nuclear. NRC, this is why. We actually inspect stuff. We actually force uh, nuclear plants to close if there's a problem. Um, should have happened in Fukushima, but it didn't. Um, okay, here's Beijing right now. They're about 80% coal, Beijing. Um, yeah, this, this is not a healthy thing to, to, to breathe. Now, 19, uh, no, sorry, 2008 Olympics, you remember, um, they shut down coal plants in a 100-mile radius and all traffic in about a 50-mile radius uh, of Beijing to clean the air up, and it worked because we were not going to take our, our athletes into this. Um, so they cleaned it up, and it worked well, and then it got back to this. Now, they've been installing large flat-screen TVs because it's very depressing not seeing the sky for that length of time. I'm not kidding. This is real. It's kind of a brute force approach. But, uh, okay. Okay, so I I can't see that very well, but just shout out. What's the most dangerous thing on this list? Just shout it out. Um, Driving. Top top four? A smoke eater. Top four? Cool. I set you up for that, but not quite. But it's it's, it's big. Alcohol, top four. Yeah. What's that? What is that? It's the leading cause of behavioral death in the United States. It is medicine gone wrong. It is not malpractice. It is not abuse of prescription drugs. That's a whole other category, which I have to put on here. Now opioids have passed automobile accidents and number of deaths per year. Did you know that? Yeah, I I have to amend that, unfortunately. Um, Yeah, so this is, you know, this properly prescribed, properly taken, proper surgical procedures, just don't know why the patient died. Heath Ledger was an atrogenic death. Michael Jackson was too, but it was ruled a homicide. Um, Prince, atrogenic death. So, I mean, that's absurd. So, since I've had six surgeries in the last five years, I'm a little worried whenever I go in for this kind of thing. Uh, But it passed smoking about six years ago. Uh, Why are we killing people with hamburgers? That's a lot of people. Okay, so, all right. Now, a biostatistician gave me grief for this because I hadn't normalized to the subpopulation. Ah, smoking really is the worst, always has been, always will be. Uh, you can think of the cold deaths as kind of secondhand smoke, which it kind of is. Um, and so, yeah, so again, mining goes up because we don't have that many miners. So that's, that's actually a risky business. It's nice to see that eating is only slightly more dangerous than nuclear power. But yeah, so again, and, and there's a reason for that low number. Uh, well, even the nuclear one be to nuclear workers, not the whole population, because that was a nuclear. Oh, someone who worked at the plant. Well, this this is the whole population. This is the whole population. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Okay, so we we can raise that to point zero 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 two. Okay, good, good. I'm glad you caught that. <laughs> yeah, no one died through my land or from through my land. Also, this is the last five years, but but yeah, no, but but yeah. Now. Even yeah, even non-lethal routine events like falling off a ladder, it's safer to work at a nuclear power plant than to sit at a desk trading stocks. This is OSHA data. <laughs> Why is that? Right, it, was, it was funnier in 2008. Yeah. It's stress. <laughs> no, it's, it's just that no one cares about safety in an office building. Right? I mean, no one, people, I, you see people holding, you know, huge piles and walking down the stairs without holding handrail. At a nuclear plant, you don't hold the handrail, you usually get fired. Okay, you have to follow procedure at, at, at a nuclear site. Um, now, I had ladder training when I was out of Hanford um, and at Los Alamos. Ladder training? It was actually kind of interesting. I, I enjoyed it. I didn't know that much about ladders. Um, it was a four-hour course. You have, to, you have to be qualified to operate a ladder, and you need two qualified operators to operate a ladder at a nuclear site. 
Does anyone ever fall off a ladder at a nuclear site? Never. Never. Now, you know someone is standing in, on a rolling chair at the seventh story of the AI, gym, AI building, you know, hanging a picture. You know that. Okay. And they fall off, break their arm, and it gets reported to OSHA. And that's what these companies are. Now, pouring molten 500 ton ingots of iron, that is actually dangerous. So, yeah, the manufacturing industry is dangerous by in, inherently. This is just a safety culture issue. Okay, so why is everyone so afraid of nuclear? Radiation. The bomb with long-term effects. Big ass. No we told you to be. I, I really apologize. My bad. But we told you to be. That the whole point of the Cold War was incorrect, but intentional association with nuclear weapons. It was supposed to scare everyone about nuclear, and it did. Um, I should kind of scare the person in the White House right now, but... Uh, but this is the whole point of the Cold War, and it worked. Okay. Uh, also, ac inaccurate but purposely simplistic modeling of health effects of low-dose radiation, and then the misunderstanding of the nature and amount of, of waste. You need to get me back to talk about waste. Um, there's just not much of it. I mean, it talks about 70,000 tons. 70,000 tons? This is uranium. <laughs> this is heavy. So the volume is actually quite small. And in fact, 70,000 tons, the, the coal industry produces that every 30 minutes. And we've only produced that in 60 years. So, again, it's a huge uh, difference, and everyone gets all upset about that. Hanford Waste talks about 56 million gallons. 56 million gallons? We treat 500, I'm sorry, we treat two quadrillion gallons of toxic waste in this country every year. To toxic water from, from the industry. industry. I mean, yeah. Now, why aren't the accidents up there? Nuclear, famous nuclear accidents. We didn't do Chernobyl, okay, which was a weapons reactor, but we didn't. Around that Fukushima, yeah, we, we told them for ten years that their seawall was crap. No, I mean, but you're oh. saying why are people, you know, what? Why are they falsely afraid of nuclear? Yeah, yeah, but, but those are relatively recent. Why have we always been afraid? Of because so we, because we tell you, yeah, but they didn't kill very many people. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter, right? So we would much rather have nine hundred fifty thousand deaths from hospital. Issues. Yeah, it's irrational. Yeah, yeah it, it's irrational. So, but there are accidents. In well, fact, I think what? early on, the industry didn't understand radiation. It was pretty okay. cavalier. In 1959, a, a group of teenagers that was 15 years old got brought through a yellow cake plant in Grants, New Mexico. I don't think they bought a bunch of teenagers. No, in, in, in fact, you can't get onto a nuclear site if you're minor now. Exactly. You used to be. But again, what, what's been the effect? You know, you lived to a nice, ripe old age here. Well, I was only there. Yes. Oh, okay. Novelers right, were right. Yeah, the novelists were working there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of the all of the yellow cake production he did from there all went to weapons. I mean, again, weapons waste very different. Answer is completely different than, than spent nuclear fuel. So if you want to about weapons, yeah, you know, we dropped two bombs. They had quite an effect, um, but that's weapons. So energy weapons completely different. Energy good, weapons bad. Energy good. Um, so yeah. But again, we pretty much have told you. We, we've told you through the regulations, um, through media, through everything else, that you really should be afraid of nuclear. It does, even though it doesn't hardly ever kills anyone, but you should be really afraid of it. And don't be afraid of all this other stuff. Certainly don't be afraid of hamburgers. <laughs> don't. Okay. Why did that come up? Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. Oh. So we've got lots of questions. So. before we let you ask all those questions. Um, there's a group of us, we call ourselves Seattle Friends of Vision, and we've been putting on talks um, here at Ada's Town Hall last April. We're going to have on November 1st, we're going to have a talk at Thompson Hall 101, which is at UW campus. It's where the Jackson School of International Studies is. November 1st at 6.30. There'll be four panelists, including Jim, like a colon from uh, New Scale, which is a new Small small modular reactors, the advanced reactors. Nick Tora, who's sitting right there in the middle, from Terra Power, which is uh, also designing the new advanced nuclear reactors. And Mark Shanfein, who has worked with the IAEA, which is the nuclear um, regulatory watchdog for the world. Thank you. And so it should should be a really interesting conversation for the more advanced nuclear and you know what's going on in the world. If we do, we've been 
doing lots of talks. If folks are interested in hearing about them, knowing more, helping us, that would be phenomenal. I'm going to pass around quickly. Chris, hello. Good questions. Do you know why in South America says that they are 100% renewable energy now? How did they do that? Wait, who? Uruguay. Uruguay. I don't know. I don't know Uruguay very well. Their, their energy signature is not very big, but if they've done it, they yeah, that's great. Is it all hydro, though? Oh, that's the question. See, you, know, you, you, you have to separate because a lot of times people you put hydro in with, with, with renewables because it is, but nuclear is renewable too. We have an, an infinite amount of uranium. There's no question about that. It's not going to run out anytime soon, especially since we've now figured out how to extract it from seawater. So we've got fuel for the next five billion years, but um, you don't usually include that in, in renewable. You don't usually include hydro in renewable um, unless you're talking about total. See, when, when, when you want renewable to look big, you include hydro. When, when you want to separate hydro out because you want to get rid of it, then you just have, have wind, solar, and drift um, in tidal. So Uruguay, if I, and I'm sorry, I should have studied up on Uruguay, but um, it has the biggest hydropower plant in the world, so I imagine their, their, their electricity is mainly hydro. Because they must be talking about electric, electric production, not right. Yeah. right, right, yeah. yeah. No, I'm looking at they have they have petroleum fired peakers, and it's a and I, but it's primarily hydro. Okay, good. So it is renewable in that sense, and so we have to double our hydro as well, which we can do by by electrifying the the hydro dams that are not electrified as present. So we could double our hydro input in this country without building a new dam. Okay, and that's what we need to do. Yeah, why are you so um, optimistic about storage? You say we're going to get there. I want to be. I want to be optimistic about storage because it solves a lot of problems. It may be difficult. It's expensive. You know, storing storing electricity doesn't decrease the cost of solar or wind. It increases the cost by about two cents. Okay, uh, I, I kill a lot. All you're doing is giving yourself flexibility so that you don't have to use it or lose it, kind of thing. So if you want to get off the grid completely. Batteries are great. Storage is fantastic because then you're not dealing with with, with with the issues of the grid, and you can take care of yourself kind of thing. But if you're an, on the grid, storage isn't all that great, and it's expensive. So, so if you have gas peakers like we do now, or, or hydro, then you don't need storage, okay? Because you're actually uh, adjusting uh, out, output to demand, and that's fine. Especially if you use hydro, it's great. That's not a fossil fuel. So, but getting getting storage up. To deal with 100% renewable it would be really difficult. I mean, in, in terms of volume, in terms of cost, and in terms of um, rare elements like the But wouldn't the EV help with storage? Wouldn't the yes. battery? Yes, absolutely. If you have a smart grid like Shanghai does, you can actually hook in you know your, your your charging vehicles overnight, and you just plug in what time do you need your car, and it makes sure your car is actually charged at that time. But 2 a.m. it might drain it completely. To, to, to use elsewhere, as long as it recharges it by 8 a.m. when you say you need your car. Now that's, that takes a smart grid, a really smart grid, and a lot of EVs. And, that, and that's great, because that can solve everything. Um, on the, the duck curve you had for California, um, that's exactly where storage would come in handy. And you were talking, you sort of didn't talk about storage as one of the solutions to that. Yeah, because it would take so much storage. But I mean, they're already in LA. They just put in a huge battery system. When the when the natural gas leak happened, right. they replaced that with storage, not with natural gas, and they were able to install a, a large storage system fairly quickly, much more quickly than they would have been able to install uh, natural gas. Even. How large? Are you talking about? I, you know, I don't know the number off the hand, but if you, it was because it was at the time the largest electricity storage system in the world. I think it's already been passed by one in Australia. But, still, but the scale of uh, right. electric storage systems that are batteries, that aren't pump right. storage, like you said, right. pump storage requires a very particular thing. Right. The scale of them has been increasing. 
uh, true, true. geometrically. Right, and, and the amount of storage we have, including pump packet storage in America, is about 43 minutes of power. Right, no, so, it's, it's, again, it's starting from a small thing. Yeah, it's from a small the, thing. The other possible solution to that is HVDC, um, long distance transmission. So, they, you know, California has this duck curve. The duck curve is the where it goes negative in the middle of the day because there's so much right. solar. But in three states away, that's not happening. And if we had more a national grid, that's another way to address yep. that. How much is that going to cost? Well, it's all going to... No, you throw in a trillion. Whenever I ask her what it's going to cost, throw out a trillion. Yeah, so that sounds about, about right. What it's going to cost. Yeah, that yeah. sounds about right. But a trillion dollars in this context. How much did the last two nuclear plants cost to manufacture? They never opened. It never will. Which ones? The ones you see summer would be Georgia. No, no, Vol- Vogels, they, they just passed. They, they're going to continue. They're going to finish. Okay, well, they, they will be eight billion instead of seven billion. Eight billion, okay, that's fine. But yeah. to, to construct the same amount of wind to produce the same amount of power, you'd ha- would cost about fifteen billion. So again, it's all relative. You know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. No, no. You really should get around. No such thing as a free lunch. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's issues with everything, and that's why a diverse portfolio of energy is more important than just picking one. Because something happens and you're, you're stuck. So you need everything. So what about Tidal? Uh, well, Tidal's great. In fact, Tidal Washington State is really good. Mm-hmm. Okay, in, in fact, the last blog, I, I blog for Forbes now, which is kind of bizarre, um, as a scientist. Anyway, um, first one I did, they said, Jim, you sound like Wikipedia, could you get some attitude? And I went, really? Um, you know, you're not trained as scientists to write with attitude, but now I have some attitude. So, so please, Jim, Jim Conquer Forbes and, and energy. Um, so, so I did a title one, and I, I listed the 10 best places in Washington State to put title systems. Um, and, and yeah, we're good. Uh, Alaska's even better. Uh, the farther you go south, the worse, the worse it is. Um, it's not very good on the East Coast. So you, you need things with high tidal wars, right, and, and strong tidal currents. So, but Washington State would be excellent, much better than wind. Do you ever suggest um, action steps that normal, regular citizens can take to to support nuclear or to um, yeah, yeah, I, you, to you, be, right. yeah. You, you want the only thing I say is science, 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 science. We, we've kind of gone away from science lately, which is really a drag. Um, so you know, when you have a problem and you have experts who can solve it, you need to listen to them. Okay, and, and that's fine. Um, so, so if you have a nuclear issue, talk to a nuclear scientist. If, if you have a GMO issue, you talk to a biochemist. If you, you, know, you have a fossil fuel issue, you talk to Exxon. So you need to talk to the experts that know that subject. The problem is we're generally ignored, which is fine. I'm, I'm used to it. I'm used to it. As a scientist, I'm used to being ignored by society at large. Uh, but that's bad. It's bad. It's bad for America because we became the greatest nation on Earth because of science and engineering. Because um, we actually... We're kind of mouthy as, as, as a country, so we, we, we don't let things go. If, if you do contact your, your representative, uh, Representative Jayapal, which is Western Seattle, is on the budget committee. And so she is on that choke point for a lot of this uh, energy and economy type legislation. She's got a few bills that are be considered. They're all renewable based, unfortunately, but... Uh, yeah. E- email your representative. I like to ask people to consider nuclear clean energy as well as the other clean energies, like include yeah. it as clean energy. Again, it's and also so fossil fuel, Texas and it is not fossil fuel. Nuclear. And you need, the fossil fuel power. is so huge, you need all the not fossil fuel. You just you can't get rid of hydro and nuclear and expect to replace fossil fuel. It's just not going to. We have too much fossil fuel, way too much. There's no, there's no peak oil anymore. Well, it's, it's about the year 500, but I mean, you know, there's no peak oil, there's no peak gas, there's no peak coal. Um, it's so far out. So after nuclear energy, what's the most scalable energy that's not a fossil fuel in, in those buckets? Tidal, I like. Solar, I love. But distributed. I even pause a waste of time, waste of space. I can't believe it. Can't believe it. You want existing structures to have solar on them because you're not taking land away from something else. Yeah. Okay, so and we have lots of structures. Every new house should have a solar array built into it because then, then you amortize the price, you wouldn't even see it. Okay, it's, it's basically be free. Yeah. And, and they've yeah. done that in El Paso. So some of in El Paso. Um, there, there's a project Parking where garages, yeah, yeah. There's, we have tons of space that's already used for something. So yeah. you put solar on there. And, and PV is better than, than thermal anyway. 
That's the nicest thing you've said about solar the whole evening. <laughs> <laughs> I have one on my roof. <laughs> yeah, but you were very <laughs> slutty like about it. the one. Like no, 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 I love it. I love it. I, I mean, feel bad about it. Because we pay for it. Yes, I feel bad about that. But that's okay. And that gets into the ethics and the justice and all that kind of thing, because I can afford it. Okay? Mm -hmm. I can afford it, and taxpayers that are struggling are paying for it. I don't like that. Okay? Uh, but but I, I, I needed to find out what it, what it was all about. So, and I do. So the, the distributed solar luck on your roof, how would that have fared in one of the hurricanes? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, the weather issues on, on energy is not trivial. Uh, and, and, and nuclear rides out weather better than anything else. So it's just, in the polar vortex, it doesn't matter. Uh, it just shrugs off everything. So, true, Harvey, right? you know, well, yeah, Harvey was, <laughs> would keep running, and, and they, they shut down three of the four plants in Florida because the, the wind speeds were quite excessive. So, just to be safe, they, they shut them down. But they ramped it back up again. Um, so, yeah, you need to build for the site you're in. Um, we don't get hurricanes, but I'll tell you, the, the, the well, termination we winds over in Richland are, are rough. Um, they call them termination winds because during the Manhattan Project, when they started blowing, they'd lose half their workforce. I'm not kidding. They lose half their workforce, and they call them the termination winds. So, so they're built so that the ice solar array was built to withstand a 100 mile an hour wind. Okay, because 150 is too bad. But then a lot is too bad when it gets 150. I think the answer to your question is if your roof will make it, your solar array will make it. Yeah. If you lose your roof, you'll lose your solar panels. So the upside is you have electricity and no one else does. If you are wired correctly, I am not. I'm into the grid. So when the grid goes down, my system goes down. I don't get any of that power. I only get that power if the grid's operating because of the way it's, it's, it's put into the system. And the only reason why Washington State would pay that amount if you're in the grid, they don't want to pay for you off the grid. <laughs> no, that's not that, but you can't flip the switch and use your own electricity. No, I can't. I, I need to spend about $5,000 more to do that. And I don't need to know right now. Yeah, I know. It's just a switch. No, it's not just, you need a battery. Yeah, yeah, you need the battery. You, know, you, you need uh, Elon's you know, battery pack, which again increases the cost about three cents a kilowatt hour. So, I, I mean, and if cost is no, if cost is no biggie, fine. That, that's great. I'm glad we're all so rich. So, as far as carbon footprints, you talked about transportation, you talked about energy. Uh, what about food and food production and yes. livestock? I think yes. that that's what fifty percent of the emissions. I'm not know. sure I, I buy that, but it's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. Cows are really terrible for the environment in general. Yeah. Okay, so it feels like you know you're playing in a sandbox of energy and transportation. Yes, that you have because we can do larger that. sandboxes. Right. That we can do that. Impact. Right. It, 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 energy is a low hanging fruit. It's the one you can most easily adjust. And the transportation is a lot more difficult, but we can do that. But agriculture and industrial, we've been doing well. We've been decreasing them, but you can't just stop that. I mean, and you can't replace farming with something else. Yes. So, are there any models a, that have actually, like you talk about the Jacobson model? Like, does anyone actually no, put that in? Not that I know of. However, uh, Washington it? State, Washington State has done a lot uh, on, 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 on decreasing emissions from agriculture, and it's one of the reasons why we're so low right now, along with the energy. But I, that's not my because it needs to be in there for a good system yeah. model. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. There is a book that came out about four months ago, and I'm going to see if I can find it. But it's like 100 climate solutions. Draw down. Draw, yeah, draw down. And they talk a lot about um, different practices in ag culture that do reduce carbon emissions. And, and they, they're very quantitative about all of them, and it's all referenced if you want to dig into the details of it. And actually, like you said, the agricultural changes are more important than the energy ones, which was, I was surprised when I read But, you know, emissions themselves aren't the only problem. I mean, it's, you know, deforestation. The worst thing you can do, much worse than burn coal, is to cut down rainforests. I mean, it's absolutely the worst thing you can possibly do. Um, you know, desertification, all, all sorts of things that we do that affect the planet. In fact, about, about the middle of Reagan's term, uh, two terms, by 1985, we passed the earth in terms of earth moving. Okay, we passed plate tectonics and the amount of dirt we move for a year. That should tell you something. I mean, humans are a global force, I mean, a huge global force. So when you do agriculture and everything else, yeah, you got to feed these people. We, we, we affect everything. 
So it isn't just you know CO two emissions that, that matter. It's everything else we do. We do a lot. So if you could, I just wanted to add. I forgot when I was talking to you that we should really thank uh, Ada's technical bookstore here for having us. Yes. the effects or the importance of nuclear waste. Uh, we've always heard a bunch of bad tales about it. Yep. But uh, the amount of increase of nuclear as a proportion of our portfolio seems to, I mean, isn't that going to be a part? No, not at all, because they're so low. The energy density in, in nuclear fuel is about 11 mil million times higher than coal. So the amount of waste produced is about 11 million times less. So again, Yes, you could double nuclear, and you still would only need one soccer field for all the nuclear waste we've ever produced. Okay? Uh, one soccer field is a lot, but again, coal fills out every 30 minutes. Yeah, okay, so again, it, it's all about scale, it's all about, you know, and, and so yeah, so, and again, the new designs are, are very different. Okay, so, you know, molten salt reactor is much less waste, much nicer. Uh, the, the, the new scale from Oregon, the, the new uh, small molecular reactor, really great, can't melt down, cannot melt down. I can't believe it took us this long to, to figure out that size matters. Um, let's get a map too. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, so if you make smaller modules, the surface area to, to, to volume ratio is such that you can bleed off heat, you, you cannot melt down. So, I mean, it's like, how did we take that long to figure that out? But, okay, we, we did, finally. Um, and that's a really nice, nice design. Oh. Go ahead. No, you. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's also potential to recycle spent nuclear fuel, right? There's only a yes. small percentage of a rod is, is consumed. Yes. And then there's about five percent. Yeah, there's still a ton of viable fuel there. And so, the, if I'm right, or if I understand it correctly, that soccer field of waste still contains a ton of potential. Yes. In fuck. fact, Bill Gates wants to burn it. Because you right, right, exactly. Right. So what's the so whole there? What's that? that? What's the process <laughs> of? They call fast reactors. Right. So okay. what's what's the holdup then of using reusing that fuel? Okay, there's two ways to reuse it. One, you recycle it into normal fuel, which is you you, you produce MOX, so you know, mixed oxide fuel. So you have both plutonium and, and uranium, which are the only two things that's good, right? Um, and so you can do that, but you don't get much more out of that. You can only do that a couple times. Um, and it's expensive, and it's difficult, and you do produce some waste, and it doesn't get too much. And it's coated as sun. What? And it's currently illegal. No. In, 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 in the processing? No, no. no. That's been lifted. Yeah, no, really? Yeah. Okay. It, it was it wait, 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 people don't realize yeah. Reagan lifted that. Right. Really? He didn't lifted know it be lifted that. Oh, yeah, yeah. We, but we don't do it, okay? Yeah. Um, but, but, but that's okay. The second is to put it aside in dry cast storage, which is really great, good for 150 years. I'm not kidding. 150 years, it cools off, then you burn it in fast reactors like Bill Gates is, is designing. Um, and then you get 70% of the fuel gets used, which is huge. And fast um, reactors are viable because reactors right now are light water reactors. Right. 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 I always said, yeah, we, we built some. I mean, we, we shut down one over in, in Hanford. For a couple, of, a couple of years, basically. Okay. Now, China just just fired up their new fast reactor, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, they, Russia has fast reactors. We, 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 we have right. But that's, that's that's the way to go. Fast reactors should replace everything. By a really short fire. answer though to that question is that it's expensive to chemically process that waste. It's much cheaper to just mine uranium. Okay. To just mine new uranium and enrich right. it. But that's right. okay. This is way cheaper. It's a market issue. It's totally market. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Technically. And, and again, if if, if you yeah. extract uh, uranium from seawater, you don't even have to mine. And we we've done that. Japanese have done that. We've done it. It's still about twice as expensive as mining, but that will come down. And again, the fuel cost for for Nuclear is, is a small part of the cost of nuclear. It's a almost five, trivial part. Five percent. Yeah, five percent of the cost of nuclear is fuel, as opposed to seventy percent of the cost of, of gas. Gas plant is fuel. So again, fossil fuel is all about the fuel. Everything else is all about construction and operations. Is we're talking about waste and the hazardness of it. Is, are there reasons for us to be more afraid of even a small amount of nuclear waste no. versus the large quantity of See, this is funny. Waste? Whenever you hear about nuclear waste, 
Like John Oliver had had a thing on nuclear waste yeah. a couple of weeks ago. I love I love John Oliver. I mean, I, I'm a left a left wing, <laughs> and I love John Oliver. But his piece on nuclear waste was absolutely wrong. I mean, every aspect of it was wrong. You should go on my show. You no, know, I, I, I I blogged about it. I got three hundred thousand hits. I thought his people would would actually call me. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get on John Oliver. Well, the waste issue is also sort of a social political issue. Yes, absolutely. If you don't spend the money to take care of it. And there's a tendency, at least in this country, to build something and then not take care right. of it. And Hanford's a perfect example of where they perfect. put we it could together. Have, we could have cleaned up Hanford 20 years ago. We know how to do it. Okay? It's not that difficult. Okay? We're just not allowed to do it. And we picked a stupid solution in 1982. I, so how do you avoid doing that, that to the rest of this? Oh, because we're not making uh, a weapons waste. You know, weapons waste is the gunky, you know, no, uh, Homer with the green goo coming out of it. That's weapons waste. Okay? Nothing like wow. that is, is, is commercial power waste. Commercial power waste is solid. Can't leak. There's nothing there. Okay? It's really, really easy to shield. No one's ever been hurt by nuclear waste, by the way, let alone killed. It's really easy. You go up, put your hand on it, and love it. Okay? I do it all the time. <laughs> so, now we actually... Because <laughs> it's easy to shield. We know how to shield this. It's, it's a piece of cake. We don't know how, how to deal with anything else. Also, radiation is, is a double-edged sword because you can measure... One atom disintegrating. We can measure radiation like nothing else. You need billions of atoms to see mercury. Okay, so you know you can't see one atom of mercury. Okay, so you can see one atom no. disintegrating. What? You probably could see, but it would be a problem. No, no, I, this, this is my field. <laughs> I try. I try. I try. So, so, so when, when, when we talk about radiation, right, right here, we're sitting here, right, and, and it's, we're at about a femtocuri level. So. Um, but we can measure it. It's a piece of cake. We can measure one atom disintegrated. So what happens when you go around and you measure radiation? Everyone gets upset. Okay, and then they say, oh my god, there's a Pico Curie. What the heck's a Pico Curie? What's a Pico Curie? It's 10 to the minus 12 Curies. Yes, it's, it's a trillion of a Curie. How many, how many Pico Curies in, in, in a bag of potato chips? What, what's the, oh, I, I ruined it. What's the most radioactive food? And there's 13,000 Pico Cures in a, an ordinary bag of potential. Right? It's amazing. Who cares? And it's, it's 13,000 Pico Cures. Okay? It's no big deal. It, it adds about 10, well, it depends on how many you eat. Um, but, but, but it depends, you know, um, if you ate a bag of potato chips a day, you would have the same. Um, uh, Dose as if you were living in the exclusion zone at Ayatate around Fukushima. Okay? But you have to eat a bag of tapes a day. And of course, the fat and salt will kill you or anything else. But, uh, but that's, that's it. I mean, radiation is everywhere, and we can measure it. So, what happens when you start measuring it and you see it, everyone freaks out. So, I mean, you know, right after F F F F Fukushima, my old lab, we, we measured uh, CC 134, you know, in, at Hanford. God, that's terrible. It was a couple of atoms. I mean, of course. It's not nothing was there. It was a trace amount. So usually we see trace amounts of things, and we get all upset about it, but they're just trace amounts. We use them for, for like, um, for, um, for monitoring air, air mass movement and, and uh, ocean circulation. We use those trace elements. It's great. It's not at any high enough concentration to even approach background. Um, so, so, okay, but we see it. And it gets upset. So this is the same thing with nuclear waste. It's nuclear waste. Never hurts anyone. No big deal. Um, we'll be back to talk about it. I don't think we have time. But if you look at the last environmental impact statement for the Hanford tanks, okay, what's the peak? If, if you want, because every time you do an EIS, you have to do a no action scenario just to walk away from it. If you walk away from Hanford, you don't do anything. What's the peak dose at the Columbia River's edge area? The peak dose is leaking or not leaking. Oh, leaking. I mean, just, you know, leaking. Just don't do anything. Don't do anything. The peak dose at the river's edge in the year 4200 is 4.3 milligrams a year. What are we getting here? Just sitting here. We're getting 300 milligrams a year. If you move to Spokane, you get an additional 50 milligrams a year. Okay? So 4.3 milligrams. That's going to really change things. And, and, of course, you should spend $90 billion vitrifying stuff you don't need to vitrify. We just need to dry it out, package it up, and put it in the salt in New Mexico. Piece of cake, we decided that in 1957, okay, was the best scientific 
thing. It still is the best scientific thing. We just got a little weird in the 70s. We became very joyful. And then we decided we were going to throw away our spent nuclear fuel from commercial reactors, but we might change our minds. This was Jim Schlesinger, remember, 1976, the first year we secretary, we got to change our, we might change our minds. So we don't want to put it away forever. We want a 50 year retrievability window in case we change our minds, which is like a, you know, screen door in a submarine. So you're going to compromise your permanence. You want to build a repository for a billion years, right? And you, but you want a, a revolving door quickly so you can get in and get the waste out? It's nonsense. You put it aside until you want to dispose of it and then you dispose of it <coughs> for, forever. And we know how to do that. It's in massive salt. It's not in that amount of tough. It's in massive salt. In massive salt, it takes a billion years for water to move an inch. That's what you want. Okay? That's what you want. And we have tons of that, more than anyone in the world. Now, the German salt was crappy salt. They tried it, I'll, I'll say it. It's crappy salt. It was, it was a, a, a um, structurally deformed monoclinic salt. It was too thin, and they poked through it. The salt that we have in New Mexico, in West Texas, we have 10,000 square miles of this particular formation, is 2,000 feet thick, and it is massive. And the, the nuclear waste repository we have, we have one, you know, it's been operating since 1999. Anyone know about that? Whip? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a whip. I mean, it's, it's, it's weapons waste. So we've been disposing of more weapons waste so far than ever was destined for, for Yucca Mountain total. It's, it's mainly plutonium and uranium waste. It's bomb waste. But, um, so Yucca Mountain, supposedly, we have more waste than, than it can hold. No. Can uh, of all the commercial reactors? No, no. We, we have more waste than was bureaucratically determined. You're talking about that retrievability requirement? Yeah, no, no. We, we said, okay, we have an entire model. We're going to carve out this a bit, and that's it. Mm -hmm. We're not going to increase it a little bit. We can't get more waste. We're just going to stick it right there, and that's it. We haven't even built it yet. We haven't even drilled it. We drilled uh, the, the main tunnels, but we haven't drilled any, any disposal rooms. Um, so why were you limiting that to 70,000 tons? Because you wrote a law that said 70,000 tons, and that's it. So law is what's governing our nuclear waste program, not science. Law. Okay. So every time I talk about salt, I get a call from even headquarters that hit me upside the head and said, Jim, stop talking about salt. And I said, why? And they said, well, DOE does not make policy. Congress makes policy. And Congress said, yeah, no. That's it. We're not going to think about anything else. We're not going to talk about anything else because Congress said it's a mountain, so just do it. And we did. And, and I got one of the authors of the license application. We made it work. It's going to cost you $300 billion extra dollars because it's the wrong rock, but hey, we can do it if you want to spend that much money. And that doesn't include the $90 billion, which is only done to go to Yucca Mountain. So if you don't do Yucca Mountain, why are we vitrifying that waste? Because it's the law. Um, can you talk about the applicability of the new new uh, development that might be required of these new molten salt reactors or other nuclear technology that might, in terms of right. capital the, cost and, and right. replacing the, coal? New scales SMR is, is done. Asia. It's done. They're done. I mean, the, the, the new scales SMR, as soon as it gets approved, they're going to start building, it'll be operational and it'll be great. Okay. But that's a light water reactor. Small modular reactor. It's a small modular reactor and, and it's small and it can't build down all that kind of thing, but it still takes the same kind of fuel that we take now. We should probably we should stop. Probably we'll stop. Get Mol molten salt requires some technological stuff, mm -hmm. and Bill Gates retired material science back. development. Uh, we don't have the, the, the cheapest, most effect effective technology, would that, do you think that has potential to replace ramping up coal in, in Asia? and? It does. It does, but we have to do it. It does. Yeah. Do you think there's the same political issues that... Very much so. It's really hard, you know, Nuclear and hydro are the two most difficult sources to license. Most difficult, most kind of consuming is hydro and nuclear. Okay. So that's the problem. So um, let's all say thank you and have a good tour. Thank you. Thank you.